<laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. Nice to see you on this lovely sunny where I am Thursday afternoon. Great. If you can turn your videos on, it'd be lovely to see you. Just admitting a few more people. Ah, hello, Deborah. <laughs> Great. A few familiar faces there, which is really lovely. Great. Well, welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining uh, this um, very illustrious session this afternoon. Hopefully, we'll have a lot of good conversations. Uh, this is really about a conversation starter and a place for conversation. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the country where I'm sitting today. So I'm sitting on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and thank them for the custodianship of this land. Um, before I get underway, just to note that there's three groups presenting today and we've got sort of a, a mix of different people um, talking and um, being part of this process. So this uh, session was brought together by three groups. Firstly, the New South Wales Regional Network of the AES. And if you don't know, the network provides networking and seminar events such as this. Um, assists in the planning and the professional um, learning program and advises the AES board on its committee on the members' issues in, in our region. So where we've got a really active group in, um, in New South Wales. So if you do have any issues, the flow is over there. Um, he's um, fantastic. So you can reach out to him and also me. So please feel free to put anything in the, in the chat box. Also to um, the Ackford Community of Practice Mel Group. So Ackford um, Communities of Practice are um, an organized and run by Ackford members themselves. And they're really self-organizing and um, really about creating space and dialogue for conversation to improve um, practice. And also the RDI network, which is a network of practitioners, researchers, and evaluators working in international development, supporting collaborative partnerships. So this is a collaborative partnership to improve the uptake and use of evidence in policy and practice. So that is who is um leading the show today and before I I'll just um get started by sharing this with you so hopefully everyone can see that in a full full form flow is that looking good for you uh no we see the um, uh all your miniature slides oh yeah that's good perfect right now Oh, good. Excellent. Great. All right. Wonderful. So I've just done the acknowledgement to country. So another thing I'd like to do is just really encourage you to be interactive as much as we can be on these online forums. But, you know, um, please use the chat box. Also raise your hand if you need to. And also in the case that you can rename yourself, um, particularly when we go into breakout rooms, then that's really nice for people to know who you are. So firstly, before we get started, we're going to do a quick poll and Flo is going to flash the poll up to you. Do you need me to shop, stop, shop, stop sharing whilst you do that? Can you see it? Can people see it? Yep, we can see it. If there's, Beauty. is it possible to put um, closed captions on? I'm not sure I can do that from my end, Karen. Maybe Flo, you can do that from your side. I'll try. Hmm. I don't think we have that feature in this Zoom. Perhaps it's an old Zoom. Is everyone seeing the poll? Yes, I've been yep. able to do the poll. Great. Okay. Everyone completed? Thumbs up? A few thumbs up? Great. Okay, Flo, what do you think? Is it? Are we ready to launch the poll? There's a few people just joining. I'll just admit them. I'll just give you a couple more minutes for the poll. Oh, okay. So sorry. Don't do some um, searching around uh, captioning. Okay. Yeah, uh, usually it's automatic on our UTS system. 
So maybe this is an old version of Zoom. Okay, Flo, did you want to share? Oh, people are still coming. I think I've shared them, but I'm not sure if you can see it. Can you? Yeah, we can share the results. I think it's quite interesting. Oh. Um, at the beginning, we can see an even a spread of people with in the level of experience. Can you hear me? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, a few more people with experience and participatory evaluation. And what we were expecting this, um, the majority of people have low budget for uh, for evaluations, which is is something we were expecting uh, uh, as part of this um, presentation as well. Any other comments from people? Um, I'd like to just know what you mean by participatory evaluation. Great, excellent. Well, let's talk about that as we go along. Wonderful. Okay, good. All right. Well, a few people are still joining, so I'll let them. Um, I'll let them join, and we will keep going. So. Um, <clears throat> what, we, what we're talking about today is such big topics and we, we recognise the diverse group of um, people that are here from across those three different um, communities, AES, the sort of MELCOP group and also the Research for Development Impact Network. So we really wanted to um, share with you around, well, what is international um, development um, thinking around what has happened in the past and, and what are the sort of now and future trends um, following this brief sort of presentation that I'll have, we'll, we'll go into a, a panel discussion and discuss these in more details. So really international development, it's, it's sort of a, it's a big term and many of us have been using it for a long time. It's, it's, it's really about this sort of program of work or an intent to um, address poverty, social injustice, discrimination. Um, most recently, this international development um, sort of program is um, framed under the Sustainable Development Goals, which really speak to um, the, the connection between people, prosperity and planet. And it's really this agenda of, about leaving no one behind. So recognising in um, um, all countries of the world, there's marginalised and discriminate, discriminated people, um, social inequality. You know, we know even in our own country, inequality is, is growing so um, drastically. So it's really about ensuring that um, there's um, better wellbeing outcomes for, for all communities in all places. Um, what is um, ID evaluation in the past and why? So international development evaluation, it's got a long history. It's been, uh, evaluation has been a key part of international development um, for, for many, many decades. And there's a, a, a big, um, body of work, both in terms of theory and also practice in that space. Um, one of the things in this slide, it talks about this um, OECD DAC criteria. So OECD is, um, as many of you know, will be the, the sort of largest, most wealthiest countries in the world. Um, and um, this DAC is a Development Assistance Committee. And so um, in our geopolitical sort of landscape. Um, many rich countries um, provide um, assistance, development assistance, aid, um, overseas development assistance, aid, development, these kind of words. They describe this, um, this funding from like Australia or Canada or US to other, other countries, um, lower or middle income countries. And this OECD DAC criteria is really defining what is evaluation in that space. And it really does talk about this kind of systematic and objective um, process. So it's really um, framing this idea of the independent external evaluator coming in and assessing the quality of programs and looking at efficiency, effectiveness, sustainability, impact. And so 
you can Google, you know, OECD DAC evaluation criteria and you'll see these all of these um, dimensions. And so uh, evaluators in the international development um, field are, are kind of guided, uh, are required to look at evaluation and uh, look at programs through this lens. And so that's these key criteria that is that is required um, for international development. And it really creates this kind of um, yeah, direction. It's it's a clear direction and a clear guidance to follow that criteria. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that as we go along. So efficiency, effectiveness, sustainability, relevance, coherence, impact. Uh, you can I can reel them off because I've had to use them in most of my evaluations that I've done. Um, there's other sort of perspectives around accountability, accountability and learning agendas. And so this has been a bit of a de debate for, you know, for a long time, but it's really about, well, who is the evaluation for? And is the evaluation for the donor? Is the evaluation for the funder of that program? And so that's really about thinking like they've defined those criteria and they're saying these are the criteria by which we want to assess this project. And then there's also this learning agenda. So thinking about, well, who is the evaluation for and who's learning and where are the um, evaluation findings going to inform the, the future? And so um, in some instances, is, is, the, is the accountability in learning for the donor or is the accountability in learning for, for the community? Um, there's bottom-up accountability, there's top-down accountability, all of those things. Before I go on, I will... Um, Stop sharing my screen because I did put it up the top. And did you think I would still remember to um, to put it in the chat box? But one of the things we wanted to do is to make this um, this process very interactive. And I so can do it. you can do it. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So I did put it up the top, and I still forgot. Um, we wanted to make this. Um, did I copy an image? <laughs> What's that? I think I copied it as an image. It's a bit weird. Oh, right. Here you go. I have to. Sorry, Karen. Uh, before we forget, um, Jeff asked a question early on what is participatory evaluation? So if you can um, make a note um, sure. for your presentation. That... Okay, great. As people, anyone put that in the chat box? Yes. Great. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll go back to sharing my screen. Oh, we're really professionals at this, people, aren't we? Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Yes, great, thanks Flo. Okay, so I'll, um, yeah, speak to those. So in just to um, reference that Google, that Jamboard. So in the case that you have questions, comments, ideas flowing as you hear me speak or also hear the panelists speak, then please jump into that Jamboard um, and add any thoughts as well. So we've already got a question around what is um, participatory evaluation. Please, yeah, keep those questions flowing and Edith will keep track of the, um, the, the Jamboard and the comments there. Um, so, yeah, so there's been this kind of tension or this kind of positionality between accountability and learning and recognising, well, who is the evaluation for? Are we, are we being accountable to, to donors' funding or are we... Um, um, supporting learning for donors such that they um, at, such that you know they take evidence from evaluation and use that in future of policy and programming or is it learning for those communities those um, in communities or government or local stakeholders who have engaged in that development program and where does the where does the evaluation support their learning and their own um, future agendas? So what are the now future trends of ID and evaluation and why? So um, the, the question around participatory evaluation is really saying um, that, you know, is it the evaluator comes in as an external um, evaluator, consults, extracts information from all those different stakeholders, goes away and writes a report and, and delivers it to the donor. A participatory evaluation is really more focused on that learning agenda and ensuring that the local stakeholders, the local actors who are engaged in that in that um, in that program, are engaged in the evaluation. You know, they're they're active participants in that evaluation, but more in, importantly, they're active designers of the evaluation. So that participatory evaluation can really cut from across 
all aspects of the project cycle. So who, who's designing the evaluation questions, who's um, leading the evaluation interviews, focus group discussions, et cetera, who's sense-making evaluation findings, um, and, 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 and who's engaging in the communication and dissemination of the evaluation. So, you know, so we can think about the evaluation cycle and we can think about different points of participation in that. And a participatory process is really recognising there's an ownership kind of quality for participatory evaluation, that it's not done on people, but it's done with people and that they own, they fundamentally own, own the process, own the purpose and, and own outcomes. So we, we're going to talk more about that as well, but that's just a, a bit of a a brief start. One of the things that's really interesting in terms of ID evaluation, and it's very similar across other um, fields of evaluation, is just this um, blurring the divide between monitoring and evaluation. So again, um, having that participation in um, those kind of evaluative questions along the way, not just at a midpoint and an endpoint of the process. And so that's been a, a big trend that's that's happened um, in evaluation. Um, also, too, is questioning evaluation for whom and this idea of benefits. So it's really about sort of recognising the evaluation use, and we'll talk a little bit more about evaluation use as we go along, but really ensuring that there's that sort of um, evaluation use by local actors themselves and how they can engage in um, in the learning and action and response to an evaluation, not just going up to a, a donor. Um, you know, and so sort of the, the, the questions there around, you know, reporting is like our evaluations always reported in an English report format. Um, I'm engaged in an evaluation at the moment and we're creating a, a short video in the local language which will um, communicate the evaluation findings to the, the local stakeholders. So it's really sort of thinking about how do we communicate these evaluations. Um, and two topics that we're going to talk more about today is this localization agenda. So this is really about, again, it, it's, it's questioning that idea of this independent external evaluator. Can't there be um, um, a local ownership and local leadership of evaluation practice? Um, and it's particularly in international development work, there's a lot of people that look like me, um, white, middle you know, middle class educated people that go overseas and do evaluation in, in other country contexts. That's not appropriate. And, and this localization agenda is really recognizing that we don't, we, we as outsiders don't know that local context and we need to work with local actors who, who lead and own the process. Um, and it's really about ensuring that we invest in, in um, that, that way of working rather than us coming from the outside and working in. And so that's really about taking a strengths-based approach as well and recognising that there are assets, resources, um, strengths in the community. There's local consultants, there's local researchers, there's local experts that can do this work. It's not just about um, external people coming in and doing evaluations in contexts which they're not familiar with. So that localization agenda came through um, the humanitarian response um, so if you Google the grand bargain, you'll see that, um, that as an international community, um, there was a, a recognition that humanitarian responses to, you know, climate, emer like climate emergencies, um, extreme weather events, etc., huge agencies coming in from outside doing the work of humanitarian response. This, this grand bargain and that localization perspective said, no, we need to invest in local locals to do that work and we need to build their capacity we need to build their skills we actually need to fund them to do that work not bring others from from outside so the brand bargain has been around for decades they're still not you know completely realized but it's a very strong um, agenda in international development and it's gone from the humanitarian space right through to broader long-term development activities and so that's really something um that is, is, is top of mind. In, in my work, um, I didn't introduce myself at the start, but I work at the University of Technology, Sydney, and I do a lot of um, international development research and evaluation, and we don't go anywhere without work, working with local, local consultants, local researchers, local consultants. We do everything together. So it's not just like, oh, they know the language, we can get them to do the interviews and we'll do everything else. No, we design the evaluation together, 
we plan the frameworks, we plan the questions, we do everything together, we do the sense making together, we write together. So it's really about us working together as one one team and that localization agenda is really important because the people that we work with, we, we work with them in a way that strengthens their skills um, and their evaluation practice and then they go off and do others themselves without, without us, which is great. Decolonizing mindsets and methodologies. I don't know how I'm going for time, but probably a little bit over. Um, so, de yeah, I'm, no, I'm pretty doing pretty well. Um, decolonizing um, minds and methodologies. So this one is, again, it's top of mind for international development. And it's really about us recognizing our um, the colonial nature of international development, of um, what was described once as developed countries and developing countries and now you know that language is is not quite right um, and the SDGs recognize that we all have you know development issues um, SDGs is, is for everyone and so um, the decolonizing mindsets and methodologies is really recognizing that there was a, a, a hegemony of um, of knowledge of this sort of western knowledge from these developed countries um, and that um, and Western knowledge, English, our ways of thinking and, and, and doing and, and sort of imposing that on, on others. And so we'll got some resources to share with you later, but it's really about us recognizing that there are other ways of, of thinking and knowing, and it's not just um, sort of our way is the best. And this decolonizing mindsets and methodologies is really recognizing there are different ways of working. So for in, for example, in, in Fiji, um, this practice of Talanoa is, is really um, a valued practice of, um, of learning and of inquiry and sharing, et cetera. And so many, or, uh, many practices in evaluation now using those, those local, local practices rather than thinking that we know the best way to do it. Um, and, you know, recognising the importance of relationship, recognising the importance of different time perspectives, um, trust, et cetera. So we have to really, really rethink the way that we do our work in international development and international development evaluation. Um, and you can see the contrast between that idea of the independent external evaluator and, and, and really recognising um, local traditions, local knowledges, different ways of working and operating. And the idea is that we don't just change our practice, but we have to change our mindset and we have to change our perspective and our identity um, as practitioners. So I'm going to pause there and I'm going to invite our panellists to share who they are. And then we're going to have a bit of a conversation um, with each other. And again, I encourage you to go into the um, that Jamboard and, and write and reflect. And we've got a bit of time together, about 20 minutes or so, to talk um, together on some of these issues. I can just jump, jump in there real quickly. With the, with the Jamboard, there's a page for each um, conversation that we're gonna be talking about, the panel's gonna be talking about. So if you look on the very top, you can go to the next one. So the first one is all about localization. The next one is around decolonizing the methods. And then the next jam board is around shoestring evaluation. So you wanna kind of flip in between each of those um, as your, your question is relevant and comment is relevant. And since I'm on the screen, I'll quickly introduce myself. I am Lindsay Riley and I work at World Vision Australia as the, the impact reporting and strategy manager. And I'll hand it over to David or Sophie or Karen, who, who wants to go next? I'm happy to jump in there. Um, so my name's Sophie Jenkins. I'm the Associate Director of Strategy and Performance within the Impact Department at Caritas Australia. Um, and I will say for those of you who are coming expecting Delvin on the panel, um, unfortunately he had to pull out. So any Delvin fans out there, I apologize for the disappointment, um, but looking forward to sharing some insights nonetheless. Thanks. And hi all, uh, my name is David Keegan. I'm the CEO of Host International. Uh, we work with primarily refugees in humanitarian displacement contexts in Southeast Asia, but also work in Australia and New Zealand uh, with more settlement type work and community integration. So bringing perspective of a CEO operational perspective to this conversation, not an evaluator. 
<laughs> Great. And hi, everyone. I'm Karen. I'm um, a research director at the Institute for Sustainable Futures at the University of Technology, Sydney. So I just put in the chat box our first topic for conversation, which is about more about localization. So how do we as panel members define localization? I think just unmute yourselves, guys, and just be ready to talk. Sure. Sophie, over to you. Great. Um, so yes, I guess from my perspective, it's, it's a big question to answer in a very short amount of time. But to me, localization at its core is around shifting the power within our global humanitarian and development system um, to more genuinely enable the leadership, autonomy and decision making of local actors and local communities. And I think, Karen, as you were saying, this is not necessarily a new thing to the sector by any means, um, but I think really positive to see the increased um, focus on localization over the last few years, particularly the impact of COVID in really highlighting the capability of local actors and humanitarian systems to respond to localized needs. Um, so I think an opportunity for us to continually interrogate the system itself um, and what our roles are as donors and intermediaries and for those of us who are evaluators, how do we, how does our role as evaluators sit within that, that system and how can we shift that power in the work that we do? Great. What do you think, Lindsay? Yeah, I think, like Sophie said, and I'm not going to say anything new here, localization is inherently about power. It's about the ability to say yes or no. It's around determining the methodology, the data. Um, how it feeds back into the community, how much the, the community owns the overall process. And so I, re I really, I see it as it's a complete shift in power. I think the questions that, that we need to ask and we're gonna start to go into in the other areas of decolonizing methods and mindsets is that sometimes our systems are not set up to do localization. And so how is it as a, a support office, which is what we're known as at, at World Vision in Australia, how do we, encourage these localization methods. Um, it's, it's all levels of evaluation too. And like Sophie pointed out, and we'll discuss a little bit more, the evaluator almost becomes a, a champion for doing localization. Having, it starts at the terms of reference. It starts with pushing back on whoever's funding the evaluation to say, oh, we need to do it this way. And if we do it this way, it's going to take more time and it's gonna take more money and energy. And so evaluators really need to be equipped to do that type of, of change management, to be the champion for localization and to negotiate quite a bit. But I'm eager to hear Karen, what you think and David, what you think. Right, I'll let you go David, because I've been talking a lot. Mm, thank you. Uh, look, I obviously agree with what uh, my colleagues are saying. I, I think what I tend to find is that localization is sometimes simplified as the devolving of resources to local actors, where it's much more complicated than that. And I, and I certainly agree that it's about repositioning power, but I think it's also about reconceptualizing expertise. Uh, and so, you know, the whole concept of localization for me is very entwined with the whole concept of decolonization in that evaluation in itself is potentially colonial in its, in its base. And, is the is built on this idea of us as or evaluators kind of having an expertise and coming in and evaluating something. Uh, I think um, you know one of the challenges is what is it you know and we'll get onto this I guess is the implications of what does it mean to reposition power, reposition expertise, and where does that place the role of the evaluator? I think the other thing that's complex that we've found is that from an organisational perspective is who owns that data and who drives the evaluation often impacts on that. So. I think we all agree that it's about that repositioning, but in practice, the system is still very much set up around yeah. evaluation being an externally driven or a donor driven mm -hmm. thing. I think one of the ways we've tried to reconcile that is by really embracing concepts of co-design and, and trying to not necessarily ignore the role of the INGO in that process or completely devolve all responsibility and power, but but to kind of rebalance, if you like, the, the relationship and rebalance the power and to enter into co-design process. But again, that is incredibly difficult to fund and resource and to do in the, in the way that things work. Uh, and co-design, I think, you know, everyone talks about co-design, but actually doing it properly is really difficult. 
but I don't want to be a complete downer on it. I think, but because I, I think the principle is actually, you know, I, I would summarize it in terms of re, reconceptualizing expertise and reconceptualizing where and how power is engaged through the process. Yeah, great. I sort of had notes to prepare for this session, and yeah, I think you've all sort of said exactly what what I was, uh, yeah, going to say. And I think for for us as um, <clears throat> is is that co design process is really important, and recognizing the the unique value of all stakeholders in in the process of an international development evaluation. And so, yeah, from a a university perspective, you know, we come with certain um, research frameworks or evaluation frameworks with sort of perspectives around, around this idea of rigour, but even this rigour is a Western concept. So, you know, we have to challenge ourselves about that, like whose knowledge counts and why do we even, even use that language? Um, but really working in that co-design process. And I think the implications are for localization is that it does take more time. It does take um, more money, but the learning is so much richer um, because of that process. Um, and so, yeah, at the Institute, we make choices now about working in um, doing work where we can work with um, local researchers or local consultants, or we have some familiarity with that, that context, because otherwise it just doesn't make sense for us to, to do that work. And so we're really, we're really ensuring that we work with um, local actors um, rather than, um, you know, working outside their process. Um, we might move to the next um, topic, which is um, thinking through um, <clears throat> decolonizing. Uh, um, sorry, Karen, I'm going to interrupt you there. Yeah. Um, before we move on, uh, I just want to echo the, the, the comment from the whiteboard. Um, mm -hmm. They basically echo what you mentioned about um, um, in, involving the local actors, there's a few comments about that in the, the resource intensive um, uh, nature of uh, localization and how that could work for evaluators. There was an interesting comment as well about um, that um, the discussion of localization also um, relevant to rural and remote communities in, in Australia um, and um, that, um, yeah, so that, that is interesting. We have there's a few resources that I'm pretty sure you're going to share later that, that refer to that specific component as well. Great, thanks so much. That's really good and good to see everyone's using the Jamboard. Okay, we might just do the do the following the same order, going around each of us and riffing off each other. So um, the next sort of topic is more about decolonizing methodologies and mindsets. So Sophie, how do you how do you sort of define this? <laughs> Yeah, look, another curly one. Um, but look, I think, again, inherently linked to localization. And I think, to me, decolonization is really around understanding and acknowledging the colonial ide ideologies that shape our work and how they show up in our day to day practice, but also recognizing in ourselves as practitioners, how our own attitudes, values, and the norms within which we've been shaped actually then influence our decision-making um, and the lens that we bring to these processes. And I think, you know, in, in thinking about this session, I was sort of thinking about some of the, the colonial um, practices that, and mindsets that are still really um, perpetuated in evaluation approaches today. And, and again, this is not across the board. There's definitely... Um, you know, examples of really strong um, evaluations that are sort of challenging those colonial mindsets. But I think, you know, just this, this value that we place on an external objective lens. And when we say external, we read potentially someone from a Western background, educated expert in evaluation. Um, and that objectivity bringing a, a sense of validity and rigor to the findings and assuming that that lens is in itself neutral. And again, that's, you know, being critiqued as the white gaze on development of, of the neutrality of Western worldviews. Um, and I think, you know, we, we do still see that quite a lot in our work. Um, and that then comes out in the use of, of our language. You know, we still hear people talk about, oh, I'm going into the field or I'm, you know, on the ground and this sort of these colonial um, carryovers of, of that type of language that's really othering um, and is really demonstrative of those mindsets that still exist. Um, and I think more broadly as well, the capacity building agenda. Um, it's not a terminology that we typically use at Caritas. We try to look more at neutral learning and capability sharing 
Um, but I think often we think about, oh, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a localized approach to evaluation. So we'll work alongside local evaluators and we'll train them up in our, in our <laughs> methodologies and our toolkit and, and the way we do evaluation. And so I think decolonization really requires us to reprioritize and revalue different knowledge systems and different ways of understanding impact and change. And I think at a at an individual level, that requires giving ourselves space for critical self-reflection, which is often very uncomfortable and difficult. Um, I think as organisations, we need to create space where staff can have those reflections. And I think, you know, the ACFID discussion paper around decolonisation and locally led development gives some really um, great questions for, for that self-reflection and learning. Um, but yeah, I think there's there's a lot of opportunity to to really interrogate those colonial mindsets that still exist. Um, but yeah, as I said, there, there's great examples of where those are being challenged and ensuring that, as as you said earlier, Karen, that 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 communities are involved in actually determining the scope of the evaluation, the questions of the evaluation, and that that locally led mindset is is built in from the, the very start of a program, because once you get to an evaluation, it's very difficult to try and instill that, um, that locally led approach. Um, yeah. Great, Sophie, over to you. I mean, um, Lindsay. I can, I can be Sophie number two, that's, that's not good. Yeah, wrong. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we all wanna be Sophie. <laughs> I feel like I just wanna say ditto to Sophie, but I did wanna just bring, I guess, the conversation a little more pointed, which is who funds evaluations? Because I think that's one of the areas that we need to be quite critical around. Um, more often than not, it's really pushed by donors and that doesn't necessarily create room for like, like so if you're saying that, that mutual learning and capability sharing or looking at impact and change. Um, Especially, I'm also thinking about board decisions and how to make decisions of, of when to pull in and out of pro, like programs. It's, there's, there's so much around where money is put into for evaluations. And it just feels like a, a good starting point. Like I'd, I hate to bring this up but with ACFID accreditation. Where, where is the criteria on how are INGOs doing localization? Should, should that be a criteria? That could be a can of worms that I just opened up. So. In that sense, I will stop and hand it over to David. <laughs> Gee, thanks, Lindsay. Um, look, I, I agree. Uh, I'm a little bit pragmatic when it comes to this topic. I think, I, I kind of think everything we do as INGOs is, is colonial. We can't actually get away from that. Uh, I, I have that view because I think we can't undo our privilege, but we can use it in different ways. And so my, approach to this that I've kind of adopted over time is to try and I guess to adopt a curious mindset that acknowledges that you that we have knowledge and expertise that can feed into a particular process whether it be programmatic or evaluation but that expertise also exists in the local context and and so going back to my previous comment I think you know my view on this is a lot to do with reframing expertise and also one of the things we've had to work through as an organization is what you know what matters in terms of evaluation to different audiences and um you know does the purity of results and reliability of data really matter to people on the ground or you know are they more interested in like is the learning more interesting and what is enough to actually facilitate learning and this may get on to the next topic but i uh, um in terms of decolonizing, I think we've got to we've got to undo our thinking around how things should work, and we have to be curious about alternative interpretations and alternative alternative ways of doing things. Because essentially, if you think about colonialism as about the expert going in and trying to implement a solution based on that expertise, then ultimately we need to reposition that expertise. Um, I think it brings into question what is the role of the evaluator for me, because um, often the evaluator is tasked with putting together something that will produce a reliable result. Um, but actually, if we're repositioning that expertise, is the role of the evaluator perhaps more to be a broker or a negotiator or an educator or whatever might be needed in that particular context? But I also think, and this has been acknowledged, I think, by some of the comments that 
that there are multiple stakeholders and you know we need to still remember that donors are often funding it with particular outcomes one of my biggest frustrations in this is that many donors are not really funding it well either not funding an evaluation adequately and secondly not funding about well not approaching evaluation in the way that we might like it to be so if evaluation is meant to be about learning and improving practice, uh, often for donors, it's about ticking a box or justifying efficiency or expenditure. And I don't think that means we can't do it better, but I think we're, we have to acknowledge that organisations are actually in that tension between the two spots. And I think for me as a, as a manager, there's often a tension that evaluators need to help me work through, which is this, you know, this idea of, well, how do we do it better and involve local communities and do something that's meaningful for them? How do we also learn and benefit from that? But also how do we tick a box for a donor who's probably only funded us a third of what it actually costs to do it properly? So I, I don't know whether <laughs> if that fixes anything, but I think ultimately to, to start doing this better, I think we need to redistribute power and expertise and but i think the other thing i'll make a comment on is reframing part of this is about reframing how we view participants uh, and so to be a little bit controversial i think sometimes we're guilty of seeing people as victims of their circumstance or as unskilled rather than seeing them as survivors or local experts or whatever however you want to frame that and and i think there's a lot of bias and assumption that we still need to work through uh, but part of that's actually about creating a community, I think, amongst ourselves where we challenge and, and have those curious conversations, I think, with each other. Yeah, great. Oh, you, this is amazing. I don't know if everyone else is enjoying this conversation, but I am very much. Um, yeah, I think for me, I just wrote the notes around that idea of the assumptions that we know. And so I think that international development has been set up with this, this idea that there's a problem to be fixed. Um, you know, there's a deficit in a situation and we need to come in, have an international development program and, you know, through that program, we fix it. And I think the, the fundamentals of international development need to change. And so exactly what you were saying, um, David, around reframing, we actually need to, we need to position ourselves as facilitators of local change agendas and facilitators of local learning agendas and facilitators of, you know, aspirations in that local context and really about um, reframing our role as not the experts and not the owners of knowledge, but as, as facilitators and as kind of um, champions and supporters of that process. So I think it really becomes from an evaluator, like who is an evaluator then? They're not necessarily like a content expert or a framework expert or a Rubik cube expert, you know, a lot of evaluators love the old Rubik's. Um, what does it mean for us to facilitate a, a process of inquiry and learning in that local context? And yeah, for me, it's really, it's the fundamentals of the, um, of international development. And, and for me, it's about switching it to a strengths-based approach. So we don't, we assume that there's knowledge, expertise, um, curiosity, interest, there's, there's, there's that in that local context. And our role is to kind of facilitate a process of, of learning, um, and amplifying that agenda in that local context rather than us sort of, you know, seeing ourselves as the experts and the ones with knowledge um, coming in and yeah, transplanting that on people. So I think it's this international development work is really, um, this evaluation work is really connected to that sort of broader overall sort of perspective of, of what is international development and, yeah, reframing and, and taking that sort of perspective of recognising um, strengths, assets, knowledge in that local context and, and recognising um, those mindsets and those methodologies in country um, is really important. We've got some resources to share with you on that as well. Okay, we've run out of time. Um, do you want to just talk briefly about just like one minute, what does shoestring evaluation mean to you? Trade off. I'm going to give you all both 60 seconds. Sophie, shoestring evaluation, what does it mean and what are the trade-offs and benefits? Great. So I think from my perspective, when we talk shoestring evaluation, we're talking those that are under very short timeframes, limited budget, limited existing baseline data or ongoing monitoring data. So really having to build creativity into doing our evaluations. So they may end up with a much smaller scope or stamp sample. We might be relying on internal staff. We might be relying a lot on monitoring data or proxy data. Um, 
But I think there can be real benefits to that. I think often being able to shift away from a big formal ticking off all the OECD criteria type evaluation can actually open space to a much more genuine outcome harvesting type process of understanding meaningful change from the perspective of participants. Um, but I think like a key trade-off from my mind is that participation burden. Um, so, you know, if we're saying, okay, we're going to, a lot of the, the resources around shoestring evaluation talk about, you know, working with your in-country or program staff, working with volunteers or community members, what is the participation cost involved in that? And is it that we're saving money by not, you know, having a very high <laughs> high fee external evaluator go over, but that's actually coming at the, the cost of those communities or, or local staff who are leading that process. So I think there are some trade-offs, but I think the critical questions is to think about uh, what's, what is the actual purpose of the evaluation and, and is an external evaluator required or can this be completed within our existing resources? What's the size, scale and complexity of the program? What existing data exists and I think that critical analysis of what the benefits and trade-offs might be in that context and, and working with local partners and communities to understand what the needs are in that evaluation. Great. Um, David, I'm going to skip you, Lindsay. I'm going to skip you and me, Lindsay, and just go to David just for one, one minute because I really want people to get into the breakout rooms. So sure. Look, I, I think I'm not an expert on shoestring um, evaluations, but I would argue that most of them are. And I think the critical thing is to always focus on why uh, the evaluation is happening and remember that you're always going to have people like me who will be trying to encourage you to save money. And, and, and I think, you know, for me, from my perspective, it's not always critical that the data is ironclad. Uh, sometimes it's more important of what the evaluation is trying to communicate or what we're trying to learn from something or whether, you know, there's lots of different factors going on, but I think try to focus on the why mainly um, and don't forget to internally educate. Uh, we also try to push back a lot to donors and, and try to renegotiate, but sometimes you have to find compromise between their colonialistic requirements and, and what you'd prefer. And so sometimes you, you just got to find compromise and work out what works best. Great, excellent. All right. Well, that's um, our panelists. Well done, everyone. I want to. I'm going to put you into breakout rooms now. Um, and in on the Jamboard on page four, I think it is. I've put the guidance for the breakout room um, session as well. So yeah, basically just kind of introduce yourselves. We'll have about twenty minutes. Introduce yourself. You know, share a little bit of background, but then get into the into those sort of questions. What experience have you had with localization? What experience might you have with shoestring evaluation? What's been your experience or lessons learned from decolonizing mindsets and methodologies? You know, where are you on that process? Is this language completely new to you today or are you in that process of curiosity and self-reflection as Sophie and David described? Um, and how does evaluation get prioritized through localized um, evaluation? And then, yeah, sort of also sort of like a future focus. What more could we be doing as a group, as a sector to, um, to advance these areas? Yeah, so, Karen, there's also some questions in the, in the whiteboard about the, the last topic. Perhaps the, the people that asked those questions can ask those questions within the, the, the breakout room. Great, perfect, excellent. All right, well, enjoy your breakout rooms, everyone. Everyone, some of you had very intimate breakout rooms with just two people there so that was very very nice for those people we had a deep conversations um, great welcome back we've got a bit of time just for a f oh. all good you're all good okay great we've got a bit of time just for some um brief conversations or any highlights or questions remaining from your breakout rooms we won't do anything formal, but because there's a smaller group of us now. Um, but yeah, just put your hand up or unmute yourself and just, yeah, share a, a highlight or um, question still remaining or a takeaway from that, um, that breakout room. I don't. Oh, good. You go. I already feel like I talk too much. No, no, no. Nope. I was a panelist. That means that you have to talk first. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, decolonizing the webinar. Um, <laughs> my name's Jen. Hello, and I was in a small group with Eva. Sorry, we just cut off Eva. I didn't even get to say goodbye. And Karen. So one of the things that we were talking about or that I was sharing was around um, being in a situation of being very committed to that localization process, but then also finding that I was working with people at the provincial and local level who were falsifying data. And so how to deal with that as the external evaluator. And so really trying to have those curious conversations to understand why and what pressures were on people to falsify their data. And for context, I work in infectious diseases, HIV and TB. So that sort of epi data is really critical, but not always well collected. Great, thanks, Jenny. <clears throat> Any other reflections on the breakout room conversation? Oh, it's a reflection. Um, yeah, it's uh, Jeff from New Zealand here. Um, on the breakout, but the whole conversation, the kind of hidden thing, it's all about power, isn't it? It's about brokering power. And I think I reckon we as evaluators are very few who can move to the different spaces where there's more and less power. And we move around whereas most other people are locked in one space where there's, and that gives us, I think, a sacred task. Mm. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Chef. That was really very powerful. Barbara? Oops. Thank you. I, I was just wanting to share that we started to talk about um, the use of arts-based and culturally um, appropriate tools when uh, working in communities with communities and trying to find out, of course, to bring in whatever you know might work uh, of, if, uh, that you've used before, arts based, etc. But also to try to find out what are some of the local ways that people perhaps um, do, you know, have drawings, do drawings, or may create a song or thing, things like that. And it's as much the process of doing that together that you learn um, as well as what you are what you collect um, and and we felt that from our um, I shouldn't say the royal we I go back to I <laughs> I, I felt that in our conversation um, we were really um, finding ways to engage and learn from each other but but also take with us with permission um, artifacts and things that show that local story and we can still knock off a survey with all the tables but I wonder which bit people will really read I know when I I flick through the tables and go yeah yeah um, but if I can read some of those cultural presentations of learning I want to I want to read more of that person's work that community's engagement yeah great thanks so much any other reflections on the breakout room or conversation more broadly? Hi, everyone. I was in a group with uh, Susan, Lindsay and Brenda. And I think what was really great about our conversation was talking about the opportunities of a shoestring shoe shoestring evaluation rather than the, than the constraints. Um, so, yeah, it was awesome. Great. Well, what were some of those opportunities? Did you... Yeah, we're talking about just when it is shoestring, it can open up a very innovative mindset because you have all these constraints. It should be more participatory where you look to the community to see the ways that they are already doing m and &E, because I have a firm belief that it's already kind of built into our different cultures frameworks. Um, so it, it, I think, brings out that that curiosity that David was talking about. And it... Mm -hmm. it um, because you have the constraints of time and money, you, you're just going to look at it differently. It's, it's out of necessity, really. And I think you used the word hyper-focus. Um, yep. Lindsay, yep. it was really good. You really focus on the added value um, and the priorities of the project, I guess. Mm. Yeah. I think that's also like recognising that in every question we're, we're asking, we're engaging in a change process as well. And so whilst an evaluation might be seen as this point in time where it's, you know, it's for the purpose of the funder or the donor or something, it's actually part of what that community is doing or what that government organisation doing is whatever they're doing. 
in that time and space, the evaluation is should be contributing to whatever their preferred future is. So I think that that's really important as well is, is recognising the, the kind of, yeah, the, the generative value of the evaluation to, you know, those people in that place um, rather than seeing it as something which is just kind of done at a point in time and then you, you shift on to the next thing. Because the questions you ask at that point are going to be like super, um, inf you know, influential and informing about how they engage with themselves and each other and, and seek to generate change going forward. So Barbara's nodding extensively. Thanks, Barbara. That's great. <laughs> Any other thoughts on, yeah, from the, the breakout rooms? Any We've just got like... Um, I just wanted to add about that um, shoestring evaluation. Um, I, I really found it like very, like an interesting conversation because um, my first, um, my, like my first view was just like, I don't like the, you know, like just the term shoestring mm -hmm. evaluation, but you know, like, but then when we were unpacking this, um, I was understanding that is because so like just a short background, like um, I just came uh, to Australia a couple of years ago and I like uh, most of my life I've been working in Peru. I am Peruvian. So like I felt like like most of my professional life I've been trying to, you know, like, do this, just like work with like very, very tiny budgets and like um, you know, like be very creative and like how we can use our very limited resources, right? So like, I was just like, you know, like just thinking, oh no, like <laughs> if there are important um, questions that need to be answered with a more resource evaluation, then we should actually fund those. Uh, but yeah, then we went, we can go back to the conversation of, okay, what is this evaluation trying to answer and whom? this evaluation is going to be um, answering too, right? So um, yeah, well, just, just that. Yep. Uh, and also too, what does it mean to have participatory evaluation as well? Because we're actually valuing people's time. Like as we as evaluators, we go in, you know, in country, as Sophie said, to the field and we get paid for five days work or whatever. And then we're having all these focus group discussions and interviews, et cetera. Like are those individuals actually value, is their time valued? Um, you know, are we paying like farmers or, you know, People have to like squeeze in everything into their own lives. Like, yeah, are we actually paying them? So increasingly, we're really thinking about that as well. Like, what is the what is the like a, a um, uh, appropriate compensation for people's time because of the the cost benefit, um, you know, the, and the and the the cost that might be associated for them in terms of participating. Tough questions. Okay, anyone? The last, yep, yeah, last point. Great, thank you, Linda. Sorry, I couldn't find the little yellow hand. Oh, good one. That was that we can still do that, can't we? <laughs> no, I just wanted to share um, a, a sort of a, a technique because I, you know, I work on gender equality, and you you want to find out the understanding of uh, gender equality issues. What are the issues in the community or the group or the organisation? And we found going in different cultures across different uh, countries that you could always ask. Um, people to identify and even sing a song that has a woman's name in it, or it's about a woman or about love or about uh, a man or alternative. And so you get the whole group talking about and analyzing that song and it would be culturally specific to that particular group. And it was really very lovely experience. Um, the way they would uh, immediately pick on, you know, popular songs. Mm. And a little bit similar with uh, sports champions in their country. So you could mount the whole questioning and discussion and around something that was belonged to them. Mm. I found that a very good technique. That sounds that wonderful. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing. That's really, really um, sounds very positive. I would like to have heard one of those songs. I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm just going to, um, <clears throat> now which, are you seeing the right side? Yep, great. <laughs> um, so these are some resources we just put together. So yeah, feel, um, feel free to, to contact us or take a screenshot or um, take a photo or something. But um, 
are, I have read three out of four of these um, and they're really, really um, wonderful, particularly um, the Decolonising Methodologies and Research in Indigenous Peoples. If you haven't read that, that it's like a really fantastic um, read and quite um, uh, confronting, really, you know, and I think we we also um, talked about that today, you know, the need for our own reflection and to feel a bit uncomfortable in, in our continued practice of decolonizing mindsets and methodology. So I really do encourage that one. Um, and there's some others there for you as well, which really um, speak to some of the heart of those issues. We've had our breakout rooms, we've had our report back. So the last task is just to say a huge thank you to everyone um, for, for coming um, and also for your participation. We do have a, a mentee, which um, I think Flo will put in the chat box that we are 